Hey, this is Mark, and we're going to begin a series on systematic theology, uh, or essentials of the Christian life. Uh, what is systematic theology? It's one branch of theology which asks this question. What does the whole of Scripture say about a particular topic? And so we're going to go systematically through the basic doctrines of the Bible, starting with God, man, the fall, person and work of Christ, and so on. And each time we're going to ask, what does the whole of Scripture say about this particular subject? So when we come to the Trinity, we'll say, what does the whole of the Bible say about that? And I am excited about this. When I first mentioned on Facebook that I was considering do this, doing this, one person said, let there be light. And that's my humble desire and prayer is that this would shed light um, because a lot of you are very hungry for meat and it's my desire that this series would as I stand on the shoulders of the giants of the past though leaning sola scriptura on, on the Bible alone as far as my teaching um, I, I do uh, intend uh, and desire that you would learn things that you never heard before. That there will be a richness and a depth to this teaching by God's grace that will bless you. And that, uh, and sometimes um, it's my desire that it might make you uncomfortable. It's not that I like making either myself or you uncomfortable. It's just that I know from my own experience that when scripture makes me feel uncomfortable, it can be a time, and often is, a time of accelerated spiritual growth. When I was dealing um, with the notion of God's sovereignty uh, many years ago, uh, I was really uncomfortable with that. But it was, a t like I said, it was a time of accelerated growth. And I hope to not be creative. You know, creativity is a great thing in every area except for theology. Because we have the Word of God and we can't be creative in the sense of coming up with new ideas. Because usually that leads to heresy. But there's ways of saying it that, um, that can be... Um, I think we live in a time of unprecedented shallowness. Uh, I don't mean to sound harsh, but it's the truth as far as much of the um, theological foundation and preaching in uh, America and the UK is, is um, just rather shallow. And um, folks have not been exposed to the richness of well, while we're Protestants, a lot of people don't even know what we're protesting anymore. So when it comes to justification, we'll see why that's the article upon which the church stands or falls. But tonight we're going to be dealing with, and I'm going to jump right in now, and that is to ask this question, um, what would be a good place to start? And... When you look at Scripture, God is very jealous to reveal himself as the Lord. In fact, over 7,500 times in the Bible, um, the word Lord, whether it's translating uh, Yahweh or Adonai, or something along those lines, or Kyrios in the Greek, it's, it's used over 7,500 times. And in addition, there is what is known as a recognition formula where um, God says, I am doing thus and so in order that people may know that I am the Lord and that I alone am the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. So there is a centrality to divine lordship. And that's what I want to start this series on systematic theology on is to ask what does it mean to say that God is Lord? I think that's a very appropriate way to start. 
um, I have in front of me a book by John Frame, which I will unapologetically um, quote from liberally, but I also have my notes in there. So <clears throat> I'm going to jump in there. See, one of the main problems within our day and age is what is known as autonomous thinking. Those of you who know me um, from previous uh, times on uh, Facebook, you know me probably from interaction with things regarding the paranormal. And actually, my first love and passion is, is theology. However, um, theology, good theology, is application. Okay? With, if it's not applied, it's not theology. In fact, I think we, we should have, uh, define what um, theology is. is talking about God and applying it to life. It's a simple way to define it. And um, so, but this quest for autonomous thinking, thinking apart from God's authority, is shot through in the paranormal community. And that has been one of my um, um, recurring motifs in my thinking and, and my challenging to the uh, Christians to think about all of life uh, from scripture and sola scriptura. So, the fundamental, this is quoting from um, John Frame. So, the fundamental point I wish to make in this section is this that Lord names the head of covenant. His essential relation to us is that of a great king who has delivered us from death and calls us to serve him by obeying his written word. But within this covenant relationship, how should we understand the nature and role of the Lord? A number of passages in Scripture focus on the nature of God's Lordship, and in these passages are three recurring themes, control, authority, and presence. I will call these the Lordship attributes, attributes control, authority, and presence. Now, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to ask you to do something. Next time that you read scripture, is, is to look um, for these three attributes, lordship attributes, because when I was turned on to this thinking, I saw it everywhere, literally in every verse. I don't want to ask you to thrust upon scripture an unbiblical grid. There is a thing known as dispensationalism, which to me is about as anti-Bible as you can get. And people were thrusting that as a grid upon Scripture in the way that they studied it and understood it. Um, this is a grid that comes right out of Scripture itself. Because when, like I said, 7,500 times, God is very jealous to be known as the Lord. So, and this idea of his Lordship being expressed through his control his authority, and his presence, which we're going to ex expound on each one of those here in a moment. Um, I'm challenging you while I'm thinking about it to, uh, when you read scripture, to look for that, how God reveals one or all three of those, um, literally in every verse, every paragraph, um, chapter in, uh, in scripture. So you'll see how central this is to understanding God's word. So the first lordship attribute is control, or we could use the word sovereignty. If God isn't sovereign, he is not God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now that's control, that's rule. When God met Moses at the burning bush and identified himself as the Lord, he came as a mighty deliverer on behalf of his enslaved people. Yahweh deals a crushing defeat to the most powerful totalitarian government of the day. Not only does he defeat Pharaoh and his army, but he invokes all the forces of nature to bring plagues on the Egyptians and to deliver his own people. He defeats Egypt and its gods and shows himself to be the Lord of heaven and earth. So the one who was... So the Lord is the one who controls all the forces of nature and history to deliver his people and thus to fulfill his covenant promise. We'll talk about the meaning of covenant in one of our um, upcoming segments. Um, so Yahweh, or Lord, 
controls the entire course of nature and history for his own glory and to accomplish his own purposes. And we'll see that it is monergistic with regards to redemption and salvation, meaning it is God's power alone that is working in relation to um, whether, whether it be the election of Israel uh, in the Old Testament or in the New Testament and the way he saves people. So, for example, he sovereignly issues commands in Genesis 1, and he even things that do not exist obey him by springing into being. Um, pretty amazing. So the Lord is the sovereign, the king, the Lord over all his creatures. Because he is the Lord, the king, he controls all things. Every molecule in this universe is under God's control. If there was one maverick molecule that was outside of God's control, it could be that one maverick molecule that comes smashing through the atmosphere and could um, lay waste to the best laid plans of God or man. And um, especially, but we know that by definition, God has to be sovereign. He's not sovereign. He is not God. And we, that's something we need to recapture is the, the absolute sovereignty of God. So when we talk about God's lordship, we start with his sovereignty or his, his control or his rule. Um, the second component of um, God's lordship is his authority. The relation between control and authority is between might and right, I'm quoting from frame again. Control means that God has a power to direct the whole course of nature and history as he pleases. Authority means that he has a right to do that. From our standpoint, as creatures, God's authority is his right to command, his right to tell us what we ought to do. When he issues commands, he is supremely right in doing so. Thus, his word creates for us an obligation to obey. When he makes promises, we can trust them without question, for they are infallibly right and true. And when he tells us to believe the truth of his word, we must do so, both because his word can never prove false and because we have a moral obligation to believe it. Therefore, God is the supreme interpreter of both himself and the universe he has made. The world is what he says it is. His word can never prove false, John 17, 17, because one, he is omniscient, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. He never lies, Titus 1, 2. His word governs all creation and particularly concerning us here, for he has authority to declare what is the case. Now, with reference to what I have been doing for the last 10 years, uh, the paranormal community seems bent on defining reality uh, autonomously, um, whether it means multiplying the entities that exist in the spirit realm to you name it. Um, this particular part, a component of God's lordship, challenges uh, that sort of activity that's going on. God is the one who defines reality, and we are the ones who have to think his thoughts after him. Control and authority are not synonyms, but they do imply each other. Since God created and governs all things, he is the original interpreter of creation, the one who understands the world and all its depths, not only its material nature, but also its ultimate meaning and purpose. God, therefore, has the ultimate viewpoint on the world, the broadest, deepest understanding of it. His word, therefore, about himself or about the world is more credible than any other word, any other means of knowing. It obligates belief, trust, and obedience. And because God is the supreme controller of the world, he is the supreme evaluator. When God creates the world, he evaluates it. He says, let there be light. We read and it says, you know, the light, it was good. He's evaluating it, and so on through the creation week. He has established the purpose of everything. And he therefore knows whether 
and to what degree each created thing measures up to its purpose. God judges rightly what is good or bad about it, right or wrong. Ultimately, his, his judgments, like all his purposes, will prevail. So control implies authority. God distinguishes between, distinguishes between himself and false gods in that he is able to tell the future, Isaiah 41, 21-29. He has authority to foretell the future because he is in control of everything in heaven and on earth. Chapter 41 through chapter 40, verse 1 through 41, 20. Control implies authority also because the Lord's creation and government establish him as the owner of all things. Deuteronomy 10, 14, 1 Chronicles 29, 11, Job 41, 11, and so on. The owner of all then sets forth the standards of human conduct, Psalm 24, 3-4. If God sets the standards, we may not argue with him. For us to debate with God is as ridiculous for the clay to argue with the potter. So, God's ownership of the world, his right to do as he wants to with his own, we call the potter clay analogy, serves as a logical link between God's control and his authority. God's authority also implies his control. His control. For God's authority to command his creatures extends through the whole universe. He has a right to tell every creature what to do, even the inanimate ones. So he controls the storms by his command. Psalm 147, 15 through 18. And by his word, he commands all things to exist. God exercises control by his authoritative word. The more I, I think about this, it is God who's the one who's the ultimate cause of all things in weather. We can talk about proximate causes, secondary causes, all we want. And um, that's, that's good. But God is the one who ultimately is in charge of the weather and everything else. If you want to know what God's sovereign will is, read the newspaper. Um, look at the news. Because everything that happens is his sovereign will. It may not be his moral will, because it's often um, broken. But God's sovereign will, his lordship, nothing can ever, ever I'm close to, to breaking that. He is the king of history. He is God. He is the Lord. And when Yahweh appears before Israel at Mount Sinai to initiate his covenant and therefore to expound his covenant lordship, he presents himself as Israel's lawgiver, Israel's supreme authority. Quoting from Exodus 20, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Do you notice that the preface to the Ten Commandments is gracious? That is, it's do this, the Decalogue, because out of gratitude, my redemption for you was by grace. And that's why the greater exodus um, by the Lord Jesus, our enslavement to sin, Satan, and death, that the um, that which motivates us for ethical behavior is gratitude toward God for what He has done. Now, you know, people get all bent out of shape about whether or not we should, uh, in some sense, obey the Mosaic Law. 600 and some laws. Did you know that there's 1,050 laws in the New Testament? <laughs> anyway, that's just no extra charge. As in the Suzerainty Treaty, this has to do with um, the covenant treat, uh, treaties. Treaty form, the Lord announces his name, describes his mighty deliverance, and then lays down the law. So, he declares his name, proclaims his control, and then asserts his authority. 
throughout the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, Yahweh is the lawgiver. Okay, the covenant document is, is the first five books in this entire Bible. Because he has redeemed the people of Israel, he calls them again and again to obedience. In Leviticus 18, for example, God tells Israel not to imitate the practices of the wicked Canaanites. It says, you shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord, your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Leviticus 18, 4 and 5. You're familiar with the, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then it goes on um, with that. Um, Time to say the, that appeal is not only found here, but often in Deuteronomy. It's one of the book's major themes that Yahweh is the one who commands and deserves complete obedience and love. Um, if you note also in Isaiah 43, which defines God's lordship in terms of authoritative revelation, God reveals himself, he saves his people, and then he reveals himself again to proclaim his mighty deeds. So, if we move to the New Testament, Jesus identifies himself as the Lord uh, through his miracles, but also which the, the, by the authority w with which he speaks. And in Matthew 7, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and uh, not do what I tell you? <clears throat> and then twofold repetition of Lord adds to our impression that to Jesus, authority is a defining feature of lordship. We may confirm this impression by noting that the large, large number of passages connect, connecting love for Jesus with obedience. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Um, this reflects the suzerainty treaties, which we'll talk about more when we discuss the covenants. Jesus' teaching also comes with an authority far transcending and sometimes contradicting that of the scribes. Even more remarkably, he commands the evil spirits. A Roman centurion compares the authority of Jesus to heal at a distance with his own military authority. As a commander tells his troops what to do, so Jesus, even from a distance, can tell diseases to leave a person. Even the wind and the sea obey Jesus' words, eliciting amazement. For in the Old Testament, only Yahweh had control over the wind and waves. But what brings most amazement and opposition is Jesus' claim that he had the authority to forgive sins. His authoritative word to the paralytic, rise up, pick up your sin, sin and go um, bed and go home, vindicates his authority to say, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. But who can forgive sins but God alone, they asked. So I'll we'll stop here for a moment and say that um, in the Old Testament, the primary declaration was Yahweh is Lord. The primary declaration in the New Testament is Jesus is Lord. Okay, we have seen that God's authority is beyond that of any creature, and we may describe uh, it as absolute in three ways. First, it cannot be questioned. God will not be tested by any authority higher than himself. His word is not subject to evaluation by human standards. It's not doubt, doubtful or disputable, as we've seen. The clay may not dispute with the intentions of the potter. And having made these qualifications, we can state that the principles thus. We know that God has truly spoken and has announced his ultimate intentions. We have no right to question him. When he tells us something, we have no right to demand evidence over and above God's own word. Paul commends Abraham because Abraham believed in God's promises even though other evidence seemed to contradict that promise. See this in Romans 4. 
Second, God's authority is also absolute in the sense that his covenant transcends all other th loyalties. We are to have no other gods before the Lord, Exodus 23. We are to love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and strength. There should be no competing loyalties, not our children. How often I've heard that, that my first love is, is my, my children. The Lord is the head of the covenant, and he forbids us to grant lordship to anyone else. The principle sola scriptura follows from this teaching. No other authority may compete with God's own words. No words may be added to God or put on the same level of authority. Deuteronomy 4.2 Matthew 15 It is wrong to bind the consciences of God's people by mere human tradition. And here in the South, uh, we're, we do pretty good at that with Dixie legalism. Only the Word of God has ultimate authority. Third, God's authority is absolute in the sense that it covers all areas of life. The law of Moses covered every area of uh, the Israelites' life. And sometimes people get the idea that it's assumed in the New Testament that it's less demanding. You know, um, look to Christ and forget about rules and regulations, but... Um, Jesus did say, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. And if anything, New Testament is even more explicit in the Old Testament about the application of God's word to all areas of life. Romans 14, 23, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Colossians 3, 17, 23 through 24. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, eating and drinking, that's pretty um, uh, mundane, everything else. You know, note the universal language in these verses whatsoever, all, everything, every. The Lord's authority extends to every area of human life. Um, there are no components of life that are, that are um, autonomous from him. Having created and redeemed us as our covenant Lord, God claims the authority to direct all of our thinking and all of our decisions. The Lord is totalitarian, as only he has a right to be. But his totalitarianism leads to freedom. Okay, so there's control, authority, and then lastly, presence. The presence of God, the third of the Lordship attribute, attributes may be seen as a consequence of his control and authority. When we speak of God's presence, we're not, of course, speaking of a physical presence, for God is incorporeal, doesn't have a body. What we mean, rather, is that he is able to act on and in, cre and in the creation and to evaluate authorita authoritatively all that is happening in the creation. Since God controls and evaluates all things, he is therefore present everywhere as present as an incorporeal being um, is. But God is omnipresent. In this section, though, we're interested in something more than mere presence. For God is not only present in the world, he's covenantally present. He's with his creatures to bless and to judge in terms of the standards of the covenant. That's the concept that we're going to explore more next time. Um, wish we had the time to do that now, but we don't. Uh, in the New Testament, we have this wonderful God with us, Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, 14, and then Matthew 1, 23. And this is one of the most precious concepts in Scripture. The essence of the covenant is that God is our God, and we are his people. That was a promise to Abraham. And at the end of redemptive history in Revelation 21, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them, and he will be, they, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. 
Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, or any, any um, more, for the former things have passed away. Covenant presence then means that God commits himself to us to be our God and to make us his people. So what Frame is suggesting is that the three lordship attributes presuppose and apply one another. If God controls all things, then his commands are authoritative and his presence inescapable. If his commands are supremely authoritative, then God can command all things, thereby exercising control, and since we cannot escape from his authority, he is necessarily present to us. Further, God's presence is a presence of divine control and authority. And this is important because I want you to understand this when you're reading God's word, okay? So it is not as if God could be divided between three parts, each representing one attribute, you know, control, authority, and presence. No. Rather, each of the lordship attributes describes God as a whole from a different perspective. I'll say that again. Each of these lordship attributes, control, authority, and presence, describes the Lord from a different perspective. Amen. That's it.